Well, this is another one of those, uh, those days. I, I got the phone, or actually a text this morning about 7.05, letting me know I have the message today. I don't know why. Again, my job as a good soldier, when I'm told to charge the hill, my job is to salute smartly and charge the hill. So that's what we're doing. My counsel is to stay full. You just never know when that text is coming to you. So. So I began asking the Lord, of course, right away, I said, well, what do you, what would you like to say? What would you like to minister on? It's my common practice. And immediately, the first thing I heard was, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so I get here, and Alan says, open up to Philippians 2, you can go ahead and be turning there. And I'm going, God, you gave him my message. I don't understand why you'd give us both the same message. He says, no, he's going to do part one. You get to do part two. So. Now, I know some of you weren't, weren't here, so Sue calls me the master of synopsis. I'll, I'll summarize just, I'll tell you this morning service, though, I, you, you hit a home run, Alan. That was, that was great. The humor, wasn't that humor great? You know, it's healing. There's healing in that humor, too. So I thank God for it. And uh, I'll start off with the premise that I think uh, that Alan started with. You know, the, and, and oops, see now, I wrote a few scriptures down here. Don't want to forget them. When I pray, that's the way it is anymore. It used to years ago, and, and I would, I don't know if you'll let me ever do that again. Used to, I would write lessons to myself. And um, I still have most of those. Well, all of those, actually. Uh, and they became the messages that I preach most of the time. But I would usually write them ahead of time and Sometimes that still happens when it's something that I'm wrestling with, you know. But over the years, what has happened is uh, the revelations come and the scriptures become the notes. And so when I come to preach, if you looked on this, you'd see maybe three sentences. But this is mostly just scripture. And it's the notes because the revelations are already on the inside. And I need to write some of those, I guess, you know. It'd be good. But... Um, the premise that Alan started with is uh, the book of Philippians is, uh, talk, uh, talks a lot about unity. And uh, the church at large and man has a wrong idea of what unity is. We normally think of unity as a horizontal thing between us. And Alan used the example, I'll go ahead and use a different example. How, the Bible says, can two walk together lest they be agreed? See, I have all of these, I have relatives in, in Shawnee, they're good people, most of them love Jesus, they're Baptists to the bone, thank God for the Baptists, if it wasn't for the Baptists, where would we Pentecostals get our people, you know. They're good, salt of the earth, love Jesus, give you the shirt right off their back, people, okay. But see, if we're going to try, like we're going to have a, me and them, we're going to try and have a meeting together next week. Wouldn't they say, yeah, well, let's get in unity first. Now I'm just talking about this up in Canada. They'd try and have a citywide thing and you get a whole bunch of pastors involved. Well, in Alan's case, it would be similar to what I'd have down there. They'd say, well, first off, Gary, we hear that you speak in tongues. Now, if we're going to have a meeting together, there can be no talk of this tongues thing because we, we know tongues is of the devil. So you scratch that off. That's something. Okay, we're going to be in unity, right? What's happening there? You're lowering the standard of the gospel. Okay, we also hear, Gary, that you preach that Jesus, it's the Father's will to heal every person every time. And we believe you can only, that that's not the case, that sometimes it's not his will to heal them. So you can't preach that it's his will every time to every person to heal them. Scratch that off the list. Pretty soon, I can tell you right now where we could be in unity that way, horizontal unity. The only thing we can be in unity on is the cross. I preach the cross the same way they preach the cross, okay? Well, that's not the kind of unity that God calls unity. Jesus would say, I and my Father are one. How you come in unity is that you get in unity with your Lord. How many of you know his mind is still in unity with the Father? There is no division between the two at all. And the Holy Spirit doesn't bring you anything but the mind of Christ, which is the mind of the Father. 
How you walk in unity is not try and negotiate compromise with your brethren. What you do is you get in unity with the mind of Christ. How'd I do, Alan? Was that pretty good? All right, I think so. So, uh, let's just start in verse 1. Now, we're going to go past here some. Not, I don't mean deeper. I just mean more content. From You can only do so much in one hour. So, starting in verse 1 of chapter 2. If there, if, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And I like how Alan said it. Whose mind are you supposed to be in accord with? <laughs> That's the mind of Christ right there. See, it's the mind of Christ. Let nothing be done through, King James says, strife. I think the New King James says, selfish ambition. Or vain glory. Now, what is glory that is vain? That's where you seek glory from men instead of glory from God. See, what you want is to do what God wants you to do. You want his approval, not man's approval. Yes, sir. I don't know why, but <clears throat> one of the life-changing books outside the Bible that changed the course of mine and Sue's Christian walk was Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I'm not even saying everybody ought to read it. I'm just saying, for us, it was life-changing. Men and women, because they would not compromise, they would not come in unity, let me say it that way, with the false church doctrine of the day. Is that plain enough? Did I say that plain? Because they love the truth more than they love their own life. Burned alive. And I'm... My job is not to ignore these images as they come, okay? One of them in particular that I remember, I wish I could remember the man's name because <clears throat> I never heard him preach, but he's a great preacher to me because I remember this image. Uh, he knew he was, he was scheduled to be burned alive at the stake and there were others that were going to be burned after him and they said, because what happens, they tie you there with the ropes, you know, and then eventually the ropes burn. And what happens, the grease in a human body becomes, catches on fire eventually. You know you have grease, right? The grease that's in you, you literally catch on fire. You become like a candle, like a torch. And uh, they said when, if it's bearable, because they know they're going to be facing the same thing and he's going first. If it's bearable, if it's if you can talk, if it raise your hands after the ropes burn, <laughs> raise your hands. So they're watching him, and sure enough, eventually he ignites the grease in his body. He literally catches on fire, and they're watching the ropes burn. Somehow they have him fastened, still there. I don't know how, but he's standing there, and he's not raising his hands. And they said, "Oh my God, it must be literal." unbearable and he's burning and he's burning bright like a candle and just when all hope was gone they thought man he's it must be intolerable he raised his hands to me to this day what a how did Dave say it I feel like sometimes such a milk toast panty waist <laughs> compared to those that have gone before us we're living in a generation where our nation is at stake I'm not going to preach politics today but I mean we need people that will stand up 
And I, I, I don't care how bad it gets. The same Holy Ghost that was with that man. The same one that made it bearable for him will make it bearable for us. And I don't care what they do. I'm telling you right now, I don't plan on compromising and lowering the gospel to be in unity with you. I plan on being in unity with him. And I plan on staying teachable along the way. Because I know there's a lot of things I don't understand. Otherwise, we'd already be in the revival. God, give us a heart like that. Mold us into weapons of righteousness like that. Getting back to this letter to the Philippians, the thing I, one of the things that, that really uh, I love about this letter, this letter is not written to just apostles. It's not written to like the Jewish community at Rome, you know, the kind of the ones that, the, somewhat among them. The, this letter is written to the normal church people at Philippi. Dave would say this letter is to Joe Public and Mary Wallpaper. See, sometimes we're accused at the prayer center uh, of preaching things to sheep that really belong to shepherds. You know, that uh, maybe we're too much on discipline, the disciplined life, fasting and prayer and meditation of the word and assimilation of the word. And they say, well, you're, t you know, sometimes we're accused of, man, you're, you're trying to share things with the sheep that really belong to the apostles. I have a real spiritual word for that. It's called baloney. <laughs> baloney. Now this letter is written to the church at Philippi. It's not to apostles. It's not to fivefold just. It's, it's to us. It's to believers. Amen? So when he says here, being of one cord of one mind, he's going to tell you here in just a minute what mind it is. He says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Don't be doing stuff for the, the glory of men. Boy, those guys that got burned at the stake, they weren't doing that for the glory of men, were they? Guys and women, by the way. Don't want to leave the women out. At Fox's Book of Martyrs, you won't be the same if you read it. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This life is not about me, my floor, and no more. Amen. Verse 5. Now here it is. He said up here, he says, be of one mind. Well, this is the mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Boy, I love what Alan said. We, we don't know the depth of the, the servant's heart that's in our Lord. To be in heaven equal with God and is God and have everything. You ever read about heaven? Jasper walls, diamond doorknobs. Why did he do what he did? The heart of a servant came. He says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Let this mind be in you. Took the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. Excuse me. Let me come up here and blubber. I don't care. I'm having a hard time. <clears throat> made himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became as a man obedient unto death 
even the death of the cross. It's not good for the video, but what are you going to do? You know? <laughs> Being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. If you mark in your Bible, I really recommend you underline the words obedient unto death. And while your thinking is there, come on down to verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always, what's that next word? Underline that one. Obeyed. And while you have that in mind, jump on over to chapter 3, verse 10. And look at the last phrase, being made conformable unto his death. I want you to see how this train of thought doesn't change. Have this mind in you. Have this mind, this same mind in you. Even though you're a child of God seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus at the right hand of God, you right now are found in fashion as a human. And are you going to be obedient unto death? Are you? You're at the right church if you want to. We made up our minds not to babysit you into heaven. We pretty much, pretty much made up our minds to run you off if you're run offable. I don't plan on sugarcoating nothing. I like it when we get to laugh and have humor. I love that message this morning. Dave's humor was largely responsible for rescuing Sue and I. We were so hurt. But that humor never blunted the truth. It made it easier to digest. <laughs> I hope I get to operate in more of that. Well, let's back up here now. I don't want to lose this. See, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And just so you, there's no doubt what kind. Even the death of the cross. Well, that's the death of the flesh. That's the death of your natural you. <laughs> that's the, he died, of course, in place of Adam. So he died in the place of all humanity. He was sinless. Made to be sin. As our substitute. But... I didn't bring these scriptures with me, you know and I know that there was a struggle between his human will and God's will. Hebrews, it says, you have not yet, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross, he was not striving against sin there. He was bearing sin there. The place where he strove unto blood, where he resisted unto blood, striving against sin, was in the garden. And what was the prayer there? Not my will. Not my will. Not my will. Three times he had to go back. And the struggle in him was so great. I read about this. There's a medical condition. It's a 16-cylinder word I can't pronounce. But there's a, it's, when there's so much stress in a human body, it causes the little fine capillaries to break, and you literally, it appears that you're sweating blood. Talk about stress. That's why he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities, he's been tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He knows it's not easy to, to surrender that will. It's not easy. It wasn't easy for him. Striving against sin. What would have been the only sin that would have mattered? What, what would be the sin that he was striving against? Not going to the cross. And that's the one that we strive against. That's why Hebrews talks about that. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He suffered. He, he went obedient unto death. And it wasn't easy for him either. 
Hold your place there and go to Luke 9. I wrote this one down. Luke 9. I want you to just see it with your, in your Bible. You know it's there. But this is the perfect place. Jesus was obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23... Your page is turning. I want you to see it in your Bible. You might underline this one too. And he said to those few. Is that what it says? He said to them all. Joe Public. Mary Wallpaper. Every, every believer. If any man will come after me. Let him deny himself. And take up his cross only once. Paul says, I die daily. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life, now notice, for my sake. You're giving up your life for him, for his sake. The same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Okay, go back to Philippians. I hope you kept your place there. Open. So let's read this again, verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Now, now we know what mind. Let us be in, of one mind. Well, what is the one mind? That we, we also will be obedient. Even unto death. And yes. Even unto the death of the cross. That's the mind. Not my will but thine be done Lord. Now by the way. He doesn't force you to do any of it. I was counseling a young lady. Uh, this week by email. That lives in another state. About marriage. And uh, I referred her to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which is one of the main passages that we have on marriage. And in there, Paul makes it clear. It's your choice whether you get married or not. He was, he, because of the danger of being a Christian at that time of history, Paul was actually saying, you'd probably be better off not to get married. It's more, it was da dangerous then. And he was also saying, marriage, there's additional burdens. You know, you got to care about the things of your marriage. If you make that decision, I think Alan's taught excellent on it too. That you know, you you become responsible. You got a you got a wife and children. You got to you got to be the head of the house, pay the bills. You know, type of thing. Well, that counsel, though, there's no denying that in that chapter seven of First Corinthians, he said, it's really up to you. You can get married or or not get married. There, the only condition was now, if you get married, it's got to be someone in the Lord. <laughs> You're not allowed to marry an unbeliever. And I don't care what the devil says, women. You're not going to change him after you get married. And you are not the one God sent to rescue him. The command is, you do not marry an unbeliever. Now, Sue and I each married an unbeliever. Because <laughs> we were lost as could be when we got saved. And God still had mercy on us. Okay, there, I mean, there's always hope in God. But, but I was just using that as one example. And another one, I'm just, I'm not going to teach at length on this, but you remember Ananias and Sapphira? You know? When Peter was talking with them, he plainly told, remember they're the ones that sold the land, and they held back part of the price. And if they would have just been honest that that's what they did, I think they'd have been okay, you know. We sold the land for 100000 we're going to give 70000 of it to the church, or 10000 or twenty, whatever. But what they did is they lied about it. They sold the land... They held back part of the, what, the proceeds, but they said they were giving it all because they, they were looking for man's approval. They were looking for man's glory, like Barnabas had just done that in the previous verse or two. Well, Peter, when he's talking with them, says two things. It's just very revealing about how God looks at man's free will. He says, while that property was in your possession, weren't you free to do with it what you wanted? 
See, God's not making you do anything. And then even after you sold it, <laughs> Peter says, even after you sold the land, wasn't it in your power what to do with the money? Is that free will? Hello. This, that's free will. God gives us free will. But what you're not free to do is to lie about it and go after man's glory instead of God's approval. Stand up and say one thing. Then it doesn't end real well if you want to read the rest of that story, okay? Why we don't have thousands of people every week falling dead for that same sin, I don't know. And yours truly being one of them in times past. Huh? Yeah? Oh, Gary, you've always been pure. Oh, you've... I don't know who you're talking to. Anyway. <laughs> I'm working on stuff like you're working on stuff. All right, let's finish this and... And uh, well, we're doing pretty good. Okay. I, I got to start with verse 5 because that's the, that's the phrase that I kept hearing, let this mind be in you. Church, you have to let this mind be in you. You're on a path of mortification, being made conformable unto his death. We're going to get to that in a minute. And it's not always easy. I said always. It's hardly ever easy. <laughs> It's one thing just to have the discipline to pray and to fast and do the, th the things that are taught here. But see, that's not really the hardest part. The hardest part is when the trainer shows up, not Holy Ghost the teacher, but Holy Ghost the trainer. Again, the difference between a teacher and a trainer. If you're going to learn football, they, first they set you in a classroom with a blackboard and they draw the X's and O's and they're starting to teach you the plays. Well, that's one thing. You do have to learn that from the teacher. But eventually, the coach is coming. He's going to hook you up with a trainer and he's going, okay, it's 100 degrees outside, but let's go outside and do some laps. And do some push-ups and do this and that. And that's how, You're going to find the Holy Ghost is the same way. Pray, 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 mortify, mortify, fast, 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 mortify, mortify, meditate, meditate to your meditator rolls out on the floor. Read first John again, read first John again, assimilate, assimilate. That's all good, that's hard enough just to develop that discipline, but see that's not where the rubber meets the road. Then one day he says, well, give your pickup to your worst enemy. I get behind me, you devil. I, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> or forgive those people that in your mind just did you such horrible evil forgive what <laughs> or uh, move to this city start a soup kitchen I'm just making I'm just picking things become a he, he might tell some of you to pastor a church and maybe you don't want to pastor a church but if that's what he's called you to do my counsel go pastor the church whatever it is he says see that's obedient unto death the death of the cross that cross represents the death of your natural choices <laughs> you surrender that you don't have to you have freedom of choice when it comes to whether you get married, whether you don't get married. Except you're just not allowed to marry an unbeliever. Okay? But how many of you knows if you make the choice, I want to get married, how many of you would like some help with the selection? Do you know the Holy Ghost is called our what? He is our helper. He is the paraclete. He is the one called alongside to help. How many of you know he will help you? guide you to the right one bring the right one to you All right wherefore well, what, what happens when the more you obey Christ the more you obey he, he, he became obedient unto death even, even the death of the cross well what did God do with it well God exalted him also hath highly exalted him given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, he's highly exalted, but the principle why that's in here is, look, 
The way up in the kingdom of God is the way down. You know, take the lowest seat. Remember those lessons? Take the lowest seat. You take, how would you take the lowest seat? Well, around here, we think one of the lowest things you can do is just start praying in other tongues. Acknowledge that you, your, your path is probably not the best path. <laughs> that there might be someone smarter than you and his name is the Holy Ghost. And that you could humble yourself by just taking some time out of your busy schedule that is so important. And start allowing God the Holy Ghost to make intercession for you. That, that'd be a pretty good way of taking the lowest room. And if you do that, you'll find over time he'll start exalting you. But that comes after the mortification and not before. What happens is you mortify, mortify, mortify. And you, you get to the place where not my will, but thine be done. Okay. Starting, let's go in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved... As you have, now up here he was saying, let this mind be in you. What's he talking about? Obedience. Obedience. That's how you become one with the mind of Christ. Obedience. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. He hasn't changed the subject. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, even though we're called to die daily on the cross, we're not called to be the Lamb of God. There's only was ever one that was qualified for that. His name is Jesus, and that mission has already been accomplished. But see, you have an assignment from God. There is a mind of the Father for you, individually. The Holy Spirit is the one that knows that mind. And as you pray in other tongues, the Spirit itself makes intercession for you, from the very mind of the Father. He, the mind of the Spirit. He knows the whole plan of God. And he knows your 120 years in that plan. See? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Reverence. Humbly. Before your God. Walk with him. What he says to you, obey. That's the context. What he says to you, obey that. The more you do that, the more you'll be exalted. Because you're humbling yourself. You're taking the lowest seat. You're giving up your life in exchange for his life. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Those things that he starts asking you to do, like forgive that person, love your enemies, pray for them that despitefully use you. Whatever it is he starts having you do along that path, that's He's working his good pleasure in you. He's mortifying you more and more so he can exalt you more and more because of your obedience to him. And then look at verse 14. In the context, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Don't complain about what he asks you to do. Now you can teach about it. I teach about it all the time. And I did murmur. Some. What pick up? I only had one pickup. I, I don't even know why I said that. What pickup? Couldn't be that one. Couldn't be my beloved pickup sitting out there. Give it to who? This guy that's got nothing good to say about me or my family. The one that's divided my family against me. The one that tells everybody I go. Something, 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 something. <laughs> Give it to who? Yeah, I don't want you to clean it and wax it and fill it up with gas. So I took it over to the. Mr. Clean. In those days, it was over on Peoria. Now it's at Sheridan 71st, I think. Went over there, and I wait. he let me wait in line for 20 minutes. It was a real busy day. He could have told me. Rascal, you don't think God has a sense of humor. He does. He let me sit there till I'm the next one in line. I'm the next one. Then he says, no. I said, for you to clean it and for you to wax it. Lord, I don't even do that for my own vehicles. Well, that's what I want. Pull out a line. The guy, the guy up there cleaning, he watched me sit there for 20 minutes coming up, and then I'm the next one in line. He watches me pull out and turn away, you know. Sue come out and help me. We spent, what, four hours on that thing. Cleaning and vacuuming and taking the mats out. and Oh, my God. Pickup never looked so good. The armor, all the tires. Pickup never looked so good all the time I had it. 
And I got to take it to him. Was there murmuring? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've learned better. <laughs> Maybe. A <laughs> little bit. That's what he's talking about. Don't be murmuring and disputing and griping about what God asked you to do. Just do it. <laughs> now, can you picture Jesus? Well, I don't know why he wants me to go to the cross. I mean, I thought he loved me. I'm his son. I mean, you know, I don't, why do I have to be the one? I, <laughs> for crying out loud. <laughs> now, for time's sake, I would love to just keep going line upon line, but we're never going to get there. Come on over to chapter 3. I want to pick up this same thought. And at the same time, I think you're going to see the, one of the ben great benefits of assimilation. How a mystery in one book, when you understand it, will lock, unlock a mystery in another book. If you don't know what assimilation is, Dave has a wonderful series called Assimilation. It's at his website, daveroberson.org. You can afford it. It's free. If you don't have access to a computer or know how to do any of that, they have a lending library here at the church, and I believe they have it in CD format. You can check it out and listen to it and bring it back. Hallelujah. Now, in chapter 3 is where uh, Paul, formerly Saul of Tarsus, he starts talking about the difference between trusting in your natural life, even when it comes to religious things, and trusting rather in the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he's given you. So, uh, let, let's pick it up in verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Now, it's important that you remember that phrase for something we're gonna, that's really important here in a little while. Does he remember that he persecuted the church? Hello? Yes, right there it is, okay. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And I have to say this every time because we have new people. That does not mean he perfectly kept the law. Nobody perfectly kept the law. If anybody could perfectly keep the law except Jesus, then Christ died in vain. Okay? What he means there is, according to the law, when you sin, you offer, offer the appropriate sacrifice or meal offering or whatever it was. And once you've done that, then your account is cleared and according to the law, you are blameless. That's what he means. But what things were gained to me, all of those things, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that's pretty low, <laughs> that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I like that part. Not so crazy about the next part. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and was obedient unto death, even unto the death of the cross. And as you have obeyed, it is God working in you working out your salvation, working out your calling from him. And that's his good pleasure, see. Well, Paul here says, I give up everything, all of my pedigree, everything that I was as a Hebrew, as a Jew, as a Pharisee, I give it all up. I count it, but rubbish, that's a good word, rubbish. 
that I might know him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now for years I did not know what he was talking about there. Uh, what do you mean, Paul? And I thought if you're a believer, we're in the twinkling of an eye, aren't we going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye? And the old body is going to be conformed into this new body and resurrected from the dead. I mean, you know, I didn't know what he meant. And I, I went to those that, this is pre-Dave. You know, Sue and I measure everything, not A.D. and B.C., not B.C. and A.D. With us, it's B.D. No, B.D. and A.D. Before Dave, after Dave, you know. In my before Dave days, I used to think, well, is he, is he talking about, you know, one of the, there's more than one resurrection, you know. Is he, is he talking about one of those resurrections there? Thank God for praying in other tongues and thank God for the laws of meditation and assimilation. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, hold your place there, go to Romans 6. When this went off in me in Romans 6 one day and I understood this, then I understood what he means there by the attain to the resurrection of the dead. It's so clear, so simple. Paul's not trying to earn some future resurrection. <laughs> I want to be in the third resurrection. I want to be in this one or that one. No. Romans 6, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized, baptized into his death. See, water baptism is a, an outward sign of an inward transaction. <laughs> When you were born again, you were baptized into his death, his death on the cross. You died. All of you that came from Adam, that spirit man that was generated in you when you were in your mother's womb. At conception, by the way, not birth. At conception, at the first dividing of the first cell, there's a spirit generated in you by the law of Genesis. And that's from the first man, Adam. But the day you were born again, that man died. From God's point of view, you died in Christ. You were baptized into his death. When Christ died, it was the end of the human species as far as Adam is concerned. You were baptized into his death. Therefore, because that's true, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life and if that's not enough for you to get it for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall all also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection What's that resurrection he's talking about? Go back to Philippians 2. Being made conformable into his death, unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's talking about walking in newness of life, walking as the resurrected being that he truly is. That's, press, that's the high call right there. Doesn't matter whether you're prophet, preacher, apostle, that's not what he's talking about. The high call of God is to mortify all the way unto his death. Be made conformable to his death. And at the same time, through that process, he raises you up to walk in newness of life. That's why 1 John says, as he is, so are we in this world. Well, I don't act like it. Well, you will. That's why he gave us these very tools to help us conform to that image. That I might know him, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. How many of you ever found out 
See that verse that we like all the time? Now let's go look at it. You're, I should have had you pinched together. Go back to Romans 8 for a minute. We love the first part of it. We don't like the second part of it. Okay. Pick it up in Romans 8, 13. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You notice how that's a capital S? Dave will tell you himself. He says in the early, early days, he thought that was the Holy Ghost. It's through the Holy Spirit that you mortify the deeds of the flesh. But as he continued to pray and learn himself, it, it, it dawned on him. The Holy Ghost got it across to him. No, that's not what this chapter is talking about. This chapter is talking the about the difference between a spiritually alive man in chapter 8 and a spiritually dead man in chapter 7. The man in chapter 7 didn't even know it was wrong to covet. He had no nature like that. His coveting, that's fine. What, he didn't know coveting was wrong till he saw it. He had to see it with his mind in God's law. He said, I wouldn't have known coveting was wrong. But see, when you get born again, God writes the Ten Commandments in your spiritual brain. <laughs> he says, they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. They won't have to go around and every man teach me about God. They'll all know me. I will write my laws in their hearts. I will write my laws in their minds. I will be their God. They shall be to me a people. Amen. The guy in Romans 7, he didn't even know. He just knew when he tried to keep the law, he couldn't do it. But the guy in Romans 8 that's been born again, not only does he know what the law is, you ready for this? Not only does he know the Ten Commandments, he has power to keep the Ten Commandments. See, contrary to the popular message sweeping the nation, God did not set you free to sin. God set you free from sin. That's the gospel right there. Now, all of us are progressively walking that out. Okay? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> if we live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, little s, if you haven't already done it, that's a little s, so you don't forget. That's the new nature. Do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Here we go again. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit there. You need to mark a little s. The first level of being led by God is you being led by that new nature he put on the inside of you. You just have a thought about lying. New nature communicates with you. Don't do that. If you lie anyway... Try and get away with it, walk off like you got away with something. You go into the woodshed. Man, your conscience will be smiting you. It's not even the Holy Ghost necessarily. It's your own conscience. It's that new nature he put on the inside of you. Now the Holy Ghost also helps with our infirmities. He'll, he'll add his power to help you too. But the first level is learning to be led by that new nature he put on the inside of you. If you follow it, it is a perfect compass for morality. For righteous living. For holiness. The closer you follow it, the easier, easier it will be for you to hear God too. Because he speaks through that same place. He speaks through that spiritual mind. Anyway, that's another day. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, by the way, I don't have the Greek definitions in front of me. There's three different Greek words that are translated sons. One of them means a little baby. One of them means a child about six or seven years old. One of them is bar mitzvah age. Y'all ever heard the phrase bar mitzvah? You know what a bar mitzvah is? It's basic. I think it's 12, age 12. 13, excuse me. Okay, 13. And they... It's a celebration. Today, our child has become a man of age to participate in the family business. Well, if you get to where you're led by the new nature instead of the flesh, God will have a bar mitzvah for you. <laughs> you have graduated to sonship, able to cooperate with the Holy Ghost in the family business. Glory to God. Red taught us about that. For you, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's the, that's the one that you received from your, the first man, Adam. Okay? But you have received the spirit, should be little s, spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That spirit on the inside of you is born of God. It's not the Holy Ghost crying out, Abba, Father. It's you. 
You're the one that got adopted, not the Holy Ghost. Should be a little less. Then the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Boy, he'll do that. You start overriding that new nature. I'm going to lie anyway. Uh-huh. Well, you might. But you're going to have to override the Holy Ghost too because he's going to add his power to help you not do it. And more. We'll teach on that more as time goes on. Now here's the verse though. And if children, see, and really that's, if, you're, if you've had your bar mitzvah, if you've come to the place where you're really walking according to that new nature, then you're a joint heir with Christ. But don't we love that? We should all have a running fit until you read the next sentence. And join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. What? That we may also be glorified together? What suffering is he talking about? Everything that Paul is writing in Philippians. Everything he's talking about being mortified even unto death. Allowing that new nature on the inside of you. How, how, how do I do that, Brother Gary? There's some really good messages by this up, up and coming young preacher. I see, what's his name? Dave Roberson, yes. Prayer, that tongues for the believer. All of those series that he had. If you haven't listened to those, you, you don't really have much else to do. Get those in you and then start putting them into practice. All right, come back over to Philippians. That suffering, though, that in Romans there, there's no such thing as growing up and mortifying the flesh without suffering. Your flesh don't like it. And it's more than just your flesh. I mean, I could tell my nicotine stories again, you know. My flesh, I addicted it to nicotine, and then it threatened to kill me when I took it off of it. Flesh don't like that stuff, see. But flesh is more than flesh. Flesh is emotions, ego, you know, man, fear of man, all that kind of stuff. How dare you try and take me down off of my self-exalted pedestal? I will, you know, time <laughs> put you to the stake. No, anyway. <laughs> all right. Back to Philippians 3. I've got to read these two together here. Verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. This, I meant Philippians 3 verse 10. And the fellowship of his sufferings. You see there it's from Romans 8 again. The fellowship of his sufferings. Let me just... I saw The Passion of the Christ, the movie by Mel Gibson. That's probably as accurate as anything that I've seen, but I don't think it still portrays how bad it was. Do you think those lashes hurt Jesus? I think they did. I think he felt the pain and the anguish. When I think about what he suffered, this is what Paul is writing here. When I think about what he suffered in the flesh in order that I could be saved in the Spirit, and then I whine, but how do you put it? I uh, dispute and murmur when he asked me to do something that's hard on my flesh. No. No. The fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. What was his death? The death of the cross. What's your death? Death of the cross. Not my will. Not my will. Thine be done. Whatever you've called me to do, that's my life. That's why we, Tim, when he talks about the blueprint, he's talking about the, the words that God has spoken to you, either directly or through a prophet or through Dave or somehow. But you know that's God speaking to you. That's your life. That's as much your life as if Jesus walked through the wall, spoke to you. Spoke to Peter one time. He says, when you're old... He said, when you're young, you're going to go anywhere you want and wear whatever you want. But when you're old, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. <laughs> and you're signifying his death, you know. Jesus already knew. Jesus knows the call for your life. He knows how you're going to die if he doesn't return before then. He knows, but that's still contingent on you following him. It's not fatalism. 
being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The key word there is attain. If you want to know for sure what he's talking about in the next verse, underline attain in verse 11. And then look at verse 12. Not as though I had already attained. Attained to what? The resurrection of the dead. Walking in newness of life. Now Paul is born again. He's not talking about not being born again. He's talking about walking in the fullness of the new life that God has given us in Christ. That's where I'm trying to attain. That is the mark right there. And it doesn't come without the previous part being made conformable unto his death. And that doesn't come without the previous part, the fellowship of his sufferings. <laughs> Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. I love Paul and he's humble enough to say that. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press. I'm emphasizing that word on purpose. It does not happen by accident. It does not happen by attending the prayer center for five years or ten years or twenty years. It comes by you doing what is taught at the prayer center. And it is oppressing. Your flesh is going to suffer. You're not gonna, it's not the most funnest thing. You're going to have every opportunity to go to the first church where they'll love you and take your money freely. Tell you you're okay. And uh, hey, if they babysit a lot of people into heaven, glory to God. At least they're in heaven. But if that's all there is, just kill me now. I want to press. Press toward the mark. What is the mark? It wouldn't hurt you to draw an arrow from that word press toward the mark. What is the mark? It's right up to bracket verses 10 and 11. That's the mark right there. That's what he's pressing toward. To know the power, to know him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death so that I can walk, I can attain unto this resurrection of the dead and I can walk in the newness of, of life that he has given me. That is the mark. And it doesn't matter whether you're an apostle, prophet, teacher, babysitter, Joe Public, Mary Wallpaper, doesn't matter. That's the mark for each and every one of us. Being made conformable unto his death. And I can walk in the newness of life. Walk in this resurrection life like he provided for me. The Old Testament shadow has fully possessed the land. That he's already freely given us. Conquer every stronghold. Fully possess the land. Y'all having a good time? I'm having a real good time myself. Now the key phrase there. One of these. I, I said earlier. You remember in verse. Uh, back up to verse 6. Concerning zeal N notice persecuting the church it's obvious he remembers that he did this is formerly Saul of Tarsus he, he's the one that stood there gave approval because he had letters from Jerusalem held the coats while the men stoned Stephen to death I mean, he wasn't going to dirty his hands with that you know and he had letters to go and arrest Christians. I mean, I don't know how long that lasted. I don't know how many saints died under the approving hand of Saul of Tarsus. But notice, although he, he knows that happened, notice when he says here, forgetting those things which are behind. What does he mean? He remembers. He, you can say, well, no, he's talking about his... Jewishness, being a Hebrew, and well, he remembers that too. He just got through telling you. It's not that he doesn't have knowledge of it. What is he talking about? Listen, you cannot let the past dictate your future. You've got to forget that. You, Paul, he could wallow in that till Jesus comes there, till he went home to be, well, I'm just not worthy. I persecuted the church. There's no way God could use me. I was the worst of them all. There's just no way. But he understood the purpose of God. He said, no, really, the truth of it is, God chose me as an example that if I can be saved, you can all be saved. 
If he can use me, he can use you. You cannot let the past dictate your future. Quit wallowing in it. And I'm telling you right now, the devil, he, he is a champion of getting you to focus on your failures. Focus on your sin. I don't want to just say sin. <laughs> focus on your mistakes. Focus on your rebellious. Focus on really bad mistakes. I mean, I'm telling you, Sue and I hired a hitman. The world would call him a doctor. But we hired him to kill a baby. It's called abortion. Just because it's legal does not make it right. We didn't know it was wrong. The devil still, I'll wake up sometimes in a dream, just, just the, you know, the, the realization of what we actually did now. And I'll, I'll have those feelings of guilt again. But I, if I wallow there, if I live there in the past, if I don't trust the blood of Jesus to wash me clean every day, part of that I die daily thing is I rise daily too. That guy died. Even yesterday, that guy died. Why? Because I died daily. <laughs> Forgetting those things. Look at it in your Bible. I'm telling you right now, you cannot hang on to the past and press towards the future at the same time. What? Look at me. Those that can't see me by video. I'm with my left hand and I'm reaching out and I'm holding on to the past. I won't let go of it. And here, I'm reaching out with the right hand towards the future and God's calling me to go to the future. But if I don't let go of the past, what am I? Stuck. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I've known Christians for 30 years that's still stuck. Uh, you know, they, they, they call it humility, but it's a false humility. It's a wallowing. It's, a, it's really pride. That thinking their sin is bigger than the blood of Jesus. It's not either. Get over yourself. Repent, you self important person. <laughs> Whew. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Whew. Gave my mouth a bath before I even spoke. Glory to God. Sue knows. <laughs> she knows me. Sit around there, tell me what you did. I mean, it's not any worse than what Saul did. God, God really did choose Saul. As an example, this guy killed Christians and was proud of it. Thought he was doing God a service. It, he could wallow in that and never let God use him at all, couldn't he? He says, I have to. Now, he has knowledge of it, but look, he got to let it go. No, no, no. I'm, no, no. I forget, forget those things at the past. See, when you do that, then you can turn full towards the future. And press towards the mark. Press towards the mark. I'm thank God that we have a Pastor Dave who's further down along this path, on this love walk, than I am. Is he perfect? Oh, God, no. Well, don't tell him I said that. <laughs> no, he's not perfect. Pastor Bronk had a dream one time. Bronk Flint from Immokalee. And in this dream, you know, we talk about we're archaeologists and we're digging down through two years of religious rubble, trying to find the original foundation stones that were laid by the, the first apostles, you know. So he was having a dream kind of along that vein. And in this dream, we were like digging down, digging down. It was really deep, you know. And in the dream, he gave me credit. I was further down than he was. That, I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> but anyway, in the dream... He was going down these ropes, you know, and it's dark, and we got flashlights or something. And I was further down than he was. He's coming down, and he says, D "He says, Gary, he says, can you see Pastor Dave?" Well, just a minute. And I'm in, in the dream. I'm shining my flashlight down here, and I'm trying to. I said, "Yeah, I see him. He's still digging." <laughs> Bronk, I got to tell you though, he's so far ahead of us, I can barely make him out. He said, "Well, at least he's there." At least he's there. Thank God. I thank God. You know, Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. I thank God we have a Pastor Dave. That we can follow as he follows the Lord. And I hope to be more loving. I hope to have more of that love manifested in me. Next time you see me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you keep focusing on the failures of the past, you will be trapped by your past. 
That's why one of my favorite sayings, you'll see it at my website everywhere, and, I, and the reason it's there is because I believe it. The best is yet to come. You have not yet seen the Gary, child of God, conform, fully conform to the likeness of his death and walking fully in the resurrection from the dead. But you will. If I keep pressing toward the mark. Same could be said for each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. Did you get anything out of that? Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Now you know what he's talking about. He's talking about walking in that newness of life. And even Paul said, even with all that we read about him, and that letter was, I don't remember exactly, but it was written later in his life. He, even he said, I don't, I don't think I've fully attained or already made perfect, but I'm still pressing. Church, I don't know anybody that's fully attained. But let's all keep pressing. Pressing toward the mark. Amen? Amen. Father, I just thank you for your word. I believe I obeyed you today. Father, I thank you for Alan's message today that is just... Uh, they're like part one and part two, Father. Yes, sir. Karamaste kiato stai. Yes, sir. Hmm. Well, I see the country of Brazil, and I know that Dave and Alan are leaving on Tuesday. Father, we just lift up these meetings right now to you. Father, only you know what's coming. Father, you have prepared the table to feed the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you that that table is already prepared, that you will enable Pastor Dave and Alan to serve from your table, and that the people will receive everything you have for them in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you now for a safe journey there, for a safe return. And we give you praise and honor for everything you're doing, Lord. In the name of Jesus.